How many of you love uh, Paul's sense of humor? <laughs> um, I have a, a very small window because I have to go to the airport and uh, uh, fly out. So I'll, I'll keep this very brief because I know you all have to do a lot of other work. But I wanted to welcome you to the city of rights. Uh, Atlanta is uh, known for being a great city. And I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to tell you my personal story, uh, which totally injects itself into what Paul is talking about. Because when you hear Paul speak and others speak, uh, when I was your age and listened to those kinds of presentations, I felt helpless. I felt like, okay, fine. Now that I can't do anything about C2, to heck with it. I'm going to go back home and eat a bugger. <laughs> but I want to give Paul a sense of hope uh, in this story. Because the very, very query that you pose to us today is, is rooted in this particular little story. In 1979, my parents and I woke up to an incredible experience. We had gunshots out of the apartment we lived in. My father looked out of the apartment and saw a soldier wielding an AK-47. And in Swahili, which is an amalgam of Bantu language and Arabic, he said the following. Get out of your apartment right now. Get out. My father knew we were in trouble immediately. And so he said, let's get out of the apartment because if he does come in, he'll kill us. So we get out of the apartment. We are then taken to this roundabout session where we find an amazing scene. It turns out they had actually run up the whole village, and the same soldier that actually asked us to leave the apartment gets to a restaurant as big as this and uh, with a, a big megaphone says, everybody be quiet, be quiet. And as we quiet down, he says, last night, two of my soldiers were killed, and I'm yet to figure out what happened. So we're going to have a firing squad until you tell us what happened. A firing squad. We were aghast at this particular accusation because in any civil society, when a, a crime like that is committed, what happens? You police it, you, you investigate the crime, but he did not. And so at random, he picked people out in the audience, one, two, three, four, come up. And those four come up to the front, and we think he's kidding. Is he kidding? A firing squad? He pulls out his magnum, and he asks the question again, to no avail, he shoots all four of them at once. The cacophony that ensued after that as parents held onto their kids and mothers crying and just in total dismay was unbelievable because then we knew we really were in trouble. The other, be quiet again, be quiet. And as we quieted down, you put another four, one, two, three, four, come up. And as those four were pointed out, neighbors started to point at each other saying, he pointed at you. Can you imagine right now net impact? Your neighbor pointing at you saying you committed a crime knowing very well that you're going to be expired. So they bring up those four against their will. He asked the question again to no avail. Those four gunshots rang out again. That was eight. Before he could bring up another four, a young man at the very back rose his hand and said he had committed the crime. They brought the young man to the front, and as I closed my eyes and a little bit of banter between the two of them, that gunshot rang out again. And I could feel through all my body, that young man's body dropped to the ground in demise. I was 10 years old watching adults, adults destroy our country and destroy the little town that I lived in. Adults. And I wondered at 10, who takes a young boy and puts them in the midst of firing squads. Who does that? And is this really my predicament? But I want you to take that grotesque picture and pack it for a second because who was Derek before then? So put it right here and then let's walk back and see who Derek is. I'm originally Ugandan. Who knows where Uganda is? Really? Uh, the last time I was in uh, California and I asked a lady, I asked the same question in an audience I was speaking, and the young lady said, I know where you're going to I said, where is Uganda? And she says, south of Santa Barbara because of your accent. <laughs> Which is why I don't trust American education anymore. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> south of Santa Barbara. <laughs> but Uganda is, uh, of course, in Africa. Uh, we are a little country the size of Oregon, very populous. Um, 
But we pride ourselves as being uh, not only handsome and tall. <laughs> what? <laughs> but we are the source of the Nile. Now, the Ethiopians think they're the source of the Nile because we have the blue Nile and the white Nile, but they're not here to give the speech, so we are the source of the Nile. <laughs> we also pride ourselves on having the largest pineapples. Paul, you'd love our pineapples, man. They're huge. The first time I saw a pineapple in the U.S., I was like, oh... America, you can make a pineapple great again. <laughs> uh, you are very naughty that you got that joke. You bloody bastards. Oh, I love you. Uh, but anyway, we also are runners, yeah? We are East Africans, after all. We are the home of the... Of the we, so far, we are the cradle of humanity. We, every time I see Americans run in the Boston Marathon, I'm like, oh... You're going to lose because the Kenyans and Ugandans are here. Stop it. Because every time you see the, the Kenyans are gone like 5,000 hours later, here comes John the American. Oh. So we have a comparative and competitive advantage in that sphere, but we are indeed a beautiful country. That's the source of the Nile. And uh, Uganda got independence from the British, and we were very lucky that we were getting this country back from the British, and we were going to self-rule, and we were excited, and my parents were teachers, both of them, and they were ready to take on the country and do some good work. But then they quickly realized that teaching doesn't get paid, teachers don't get paid very well, am I right? They don't get, is that true in the U.S. as well? Well, we got to do something about that, don't we? But my parents were not going to wait for you to do something about it because they were going to do something about it themselves, so they became entrepreneurs right before my eyes. And my mother became a wedding gown seamstress. She taught herself how to make wedding gown dresses. And I joke all the time that she didn't have flower gown dresses, uh, I mean mannequins for flower gown dresses, so guess who the mannequin was? <laughs> yes, you are right. It was Paul. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, which is why I dress better than Paul. You're right, I was me, you know. I, uh, I'm, I'm into fashion and all that stuff. I'm very comfortable with the, you know, the yellows and the pinks and... Uh, we did very well, and my son hates that joke because it's, I tell him, you're, Kevin, your, son, your father's been a cross-dresser since he was five. <laughs> and he was born here, so he's very American. He's like, don't embarrass me, I'm in high school. <laughs> well, you embarrass me all the time. <laughs> um, in juxtaposition, my father became a soap maker. We're going to talk about that in a minute now. And together they built two businesses that became very prosperous and they became very, very well to do. And then guess who took power? Idi Amin. And Idi Amin was a reprobate leader that came into power and destroyed systematically our country. Uh, I sat in the same class with Idi Amin's son. In fact, we were desk mates. And here we were, two boys, one whose father was the president of the country, destroying the country. And the other one, who had a father who built enterprise, building the country. And that bifurcation offered a binary falsehood. And so, bring back that grotesque picture right here. I then believed to become a refugee in Kenya. I landed in Kenya, and those of you who have not been to Kenya, Kenya is a lovely country. It's the land of Mufasa. The Indian Ocean, it's beautiful and glorious. I was put in the hands of a, an American woman from Pittsburgh to raise me. If you've never met women from Pittsburgh, you should meet them. <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> so Marge was very American. How many of you have met Americans before? <laughs> They're ridiculous. So the first time I met an American woman from Pittsburgh, Marge, to raise me as a refugee kid, he's run, she's running up and down, and she comes to me, and she says, Derek, how are you doing? And I said, I'm great, darling, how are you doing? <laughs> because I'm British raised in that kind of sense. And she runs back and says, would you care for a cup of tea? I said, oh, gloriously, yes, I would love to get a cup of tea. She runs back to the kitchen, gets a cup of tea, comes back to me, and then runs back, and I take the cup of tea, take a sip, oh, And it's cold. <laughs> Four par. <laughs> so I set it back down. She comes back running. She's like, what's wrong, Derek? And she does what American women do. For those of you American women in here, help me know what this means.
And I said, are you okay, darling? She's like, wait, what's wrong? I said, I think you forgot to cook the tea, darling. She goes, no, that's American iced tea. You should love that, young man. I said, okay. You still forgot to cook it. So we became very good friends. She taught me a little bit about this country. Then I got a chance to come to go to school in the U.S. And I land in the city of brother love. What city is that? Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, okay. So I get here, and I get into a hotel. And the hotel room is copacetic and lovely. Big pillows, lovely linen, white linen, usually. And I walk into the bathroom, and there are three bars of soap in the bathroom. Facial soap, body soap, and hand-washing soap. What's the difference? Because, <laughs> you know, my father made soap, guys, so I knew something about soap. Now I'm looking for my bad soap, my uncle's soap. I'm like, what? <laughs> Man, no, no, this is Americans being, what, bougie, isn't it? The rest of us in the world use regular soap. You bloody bastards. So I take the two bars, put them in the bag for next day. And I come back that evening, and what do you think they had done? They brought more soap. But I'm a bloody refuge. I'm going to steal the heck out of that soap. I take the two bars. So for three days, I'm stealing soap. So how many of you have stolen soap from hotels before? Come on, be honest. Oh! Good heavens, you thieves. Yeah, net impact, so my butt. And so I realized they're gonna charge me for this soap. I take the little stolen goods, I go back downstairs to give them back, yeah, because I can't afford it. And I get downstairs, and guess who is downstairs? The concierge, an African American man, elegant. I've never met African Americans before at that time. My only experience with African Americans was through the movie Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> so I'm, because you know, Eddie is the funniest. How many, I met Dave Chappelle the other day. How many, do you guys know Dave Chappelle? I was like, David, you are not funny. You know who is funny? Eddie Murphy. <laughs> she was like, ooh. And so I go up to him and I, uh, you know, I say, hey, hey, what's up, brother? He says, yeah, what's up, young man? I said, well, I have a secret for you. I said, yeah? I said to him, well, I've been stealing your soap. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> like from housekeeping? I said, no, no, you keep on bringing me soap. I can't afford it. Take it back to housekeeping. Tell them not to charge me for it. He burst out laughing. He said, are you African? Are you Nigerian? Because we're all Nigerians to you guys, aren't we? <laughs> we're the ones that sent you that email that says, my father just died and left me with a billion dollars. If you could share with me your social security number, <laughs> your bank account. We could share the money. Don't do that. <laughs> so we butted around, and uh, finally, uh, he said, no, Derek, you see all these Americans over here. They still soap, too, so you're good, brother. I said, OK. So as I walked away from him, a thought came to mind. What about the partially used bar of soap? So I go back to him. I said, what about the partially used bar of soap? And he says, well, we throw those out. I said, this hotel, every hotel. He says, every hotel in the US throws away soap because you've used it. Ugh. I was like, what do you mean, ugh? Because where I'm from, we share soap. Yeah? When, I, when my mother takes a bath, I don't go, oh, good God, Miriam. And throw it out. I mean, I may throw away my brother's soap because he's yak, but I love my mother. And so I go back to my room and I, a thought comes to me well, wow, how much soap do they really throw away? And I'm gonna run through this really quickly. Do you wanna see my mom and dad and myself before we do that? Okay. That's me. Oh, I love you too, sweetheart. That's mom and dad. Uh, two colonials, and uh, that's the soap that the hotels throw away. Do you know how much hotels throw away every year? Let me run through this and show you the number. Did you see it? Uh, 
American hotels throw away 800 million bars of soap every day. I mean every year. That is 2.6 million bars of soap. I think the math is right. Every day. Into the environment. And if you do the study around that soap in the environment, when you throw it into the trash, it slows down the metabolism of the germs or whatever that eats up the rubbish. And so, what Paul has just talked to us about this afternoon is the grand scheme of things, what we are faced with. What I want to talk to you about is what can you do individually as a person to reverse things like this. And here's the first thing, because the path to purpose is the theme to your conference. It will not do you any good to listen to more Pauls and to more Derricks if you purposefully are not invested in doing something about these things. And so when I got here into this country, I realized that the, the reason why I'm in this great nation is because I wanted to be part of a human experiment, which means all of us get here to the US to do something about things. Not to whine. In fact, there's a, a great uh, movie in the U.S. by Tom Hanks that says in, there's, no crying, there's no crying in what? In baseball. So if you want to come to the U.S. and complain and be ant uh, antagonistic and be antithetical and, and pathetic, then you know what? Leave. Go. Go somewhere else. But if you want to be part of this incredible experiment that can get all these brains together, regardless of who we are, to solve that number, then come here and be part of it. So what does it take for anyone to do remarkable things in life? Because that's you really what we're looking for. Number one, understand what your skill sets are and invest in them. Because if you understand your skill sets and you invest in them, then you are going to meet the challenge and you will be ready. Yeah? It's like my son. My son now, Kevin, is 17 years old and he's 6'5 and he plays basketball. And you know what, he's, you know what he does every day to become the best, best basketball player he, he can be? He wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning, doesn't take a shower, and goes to the gym and plays basketball for two hours. How are you going to compete with Kevin if you play basketball for two minutes? So find your skill set now and become good at it. And how do you become good? By constantly practicing and practicing and practicing. Number two, once you find your skill set, find your passion. Because purpose without passion is like having a Bentley without fuel. And hopefully good fuel that Paul can agree with. <laughs> because how many of us have purpose? All of us have purpose. But how many of you or us are lackluster and lack the drive to really stand up to our skill set and do some remarkable stuff? Because if you want to do great things in life, exceptional things in life, don't think you're going to come in here and be what? Lukewarm. You will lose. Because failure is the third thing. Failure is the distant cousin to success. And she guards success with all passion. Because the job of failure is to tell you you are not ready yet to take my little sister success. And some of you look at failure as the only thing that, oh my goodness, I, I, I hate failing. You know why you hate failing? Because you're not ready to look into your weaknesses and get better. And for you to have impact, for you to do what Paul is asking you to do, you're not gonna come up here poor in your intellect poor in your energy to actually commit. That lack of zeal, the lack of passion is not going to get you there. 
And so when I built the Global Soap Project, in conclusion, I had to do all those things. I learned the US, I learned the culture, I learned the organization structures. How do Americans do things? And then I went to Hilton and asked for $1.3 million to build my first factory. And the first thing they told me was what? After I told them the story about Uganda, I thought they were going to give me the check that night. Yeah? And they said, oh, no. <laughs> and I had to go back and think, why no? And I realized, ah, I had left out the most quintessential parts of who I was. What was I learning? Because some of you are in school, and you think it's a perfunctory process, but I know that you're not here because of that. Because the real people who are perfunctory are the ones who didn't show up today. But you guys, I'm singing to the choir, but I still need to energize you. So this is what we did. I went back and thought to myself, ah, the way to get the $1.3 million is not to argue the emotional point, which is what happens to points that, like what Paul has just mentioned. The emotional points, the science, you're not going to argue people into that. So I went back and I did my math. Huh. How many hotel rooms does the Hilton have in the US? How many people come and stay in those hotel rooms? Therefore, how much, how much soap do they leave behind? That's the algorithm. Remember when we did algorithm in class? That day, I was lucky I did not go to sleep. So I remembered what algorithm, I remembered how to build an algorithm. So I did that, and then went to West Management, and I said, if I was throwing X amount of tonnage, how much would you charge me for it? And guess how much it was? I gave you a hint, $1.3 million. So I went back to you and I said, oh, forget about mamas dying in Africa. Who cares about mamas dying? How about we talk about math? So we talked about math, and I left with a $1.3 million check. And I built my first factory up in Vegas. Why Vegas? Ah, a lot of sin soap, am I right? We now recycle soap in Vegas because it's the largest dump of soap. We recycle soap in Orlando. Why Orlando? Because of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> we have a factory in Hong Kong. We get it went in, in Rome, Italy. I'll, I'll, I'll end with a, a couple of things. Uh, because of what I did in terms of learning who I was and building around this idea that even though I was this African refugee kid, that that does not mean that that's my continuum. I'm not going to be uh, characterized by my condition around me. <laughs> that I was going to develop a, a, a motto for myself that would help me do the things that I'm being asked to do. And so, as we get to self, um, somebody's helping me move this along. Let me see if I can do that. Um, that's my motto. And I'm going to tell you what it means. Um, it's an acronym. Uh, guys, remember to serve. When you serve in the community, you get to see the loopholes and the needs of the community. A, a, a leader who has served before can be seen from afar. They are humbled by uh, this idea of respecting other human beings in, in life. You could be the best scientist in the world, but if you suck as a human being, nobody wants to listen to you. <laughs> you could be the best uh, guitar player, but if you're horrible as a human being, I don't care about you and your skill. You know what I really care about and I've learned at the, at the age of 10, seeing human beings kill other human beings? is that a human being that doesn't care about another human being really is not important to me, however gifted they are. Because if you don't respect others and don't serve others and are not invested in using your skills to build a, a committee that we can all then respect each other, then it doesn't matter. Because you're the same person who look at a, 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 a disabled person or, or an enabled person and laugh and make fun of them. But when you serve, that's important. Education. So when you see the loopholes in service, then you educate yourself. 
you become good at what you, you're supposed to be doing. So when you come to the marketplace to actually tell us that you're good at what you do, the marketplace can validate you. And out of those two things becomes a leader. A leader who is served, who is educated, then can become the poor. Then you can come here with authority and talk to us about serve. Paul would not have come to talk to us if he had not done what? The service work of learning and investigating and doing all that work, then telling us that these are the numbers. That's what a leader is. And then lastly, you know, we laugh about faith all the time. And it's okay to be agnostic and all those things, not just in religious terms. But let me tell you something about faith. First of all, faith in yourself. Uh, people who have no faith in themselves, you can see from afar. They have no conviction. And to see a leader who has no conviction, especially in, 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 the, in the need to protect others and the need to protect the environment, to, to protect the, the general jurisdiction in which we, we reside, is really somebody you ought not to follow. A leader who has faith in others, faith in yourself, then faith in others, then can have impact, and indeed net impact. And so I'll leave you with a quote before I run off. And for those of you who want to do questions, please follow me on social media. Um, I can answer any question that you have, because I just cut the story uh, by a lot, because Africans usually tell a longer story than I did today. <laughs> I'll leave you with this quote. Just, uh, just for you guys. Um, I became the CEO for the Center for Civil and Human Rights after I had done all the work of proving that I understood the power of civil rights. The key to humanity is civil rights. Rights. Just like the key to mathematics is multiplication tables. It's a small little thing, but multiplication, multiplications are important, yeah? If you learn them, you can do fractions, division, it's easy. For a periodic table, it's, the, you know, it's chemistry and all that stuff. If you learn that, you can do chemistry very easily kind of thing. For human beings, it's rights. That's what Paul just said. You take away the rights of a girl. Guess what happens to us? You take away the rights of the LGBT community. Guess what happens to us? You take away the rights for immigrants. Guess what happens to us? Because if I was never given a chance... As a young man from Africa to come and live in this country and become an American citizen, which I did seven years ago, you would never have a former refugee who looks this handsome. <laughs> this is what a refugee kid looks like when you give them their rights. But more so, some of you are going to get a chance to go to the Center for Civil and Human Rights right across the street. To go from being a refugee kid on death row, literally, to being the CEO for the Center for Civil and Human Rights, which is the human rights movement in your country and therefore in the world, is the passing of the baton by John Lewis, by Andrew Young, by Martin Luther King, to this new generation, which is me and you, to not conclude the conversation, but to start to regenerate the conversation with new energy. So as you do your work today, in the next couple of days, understand that it takes self, you. Stop reading self-help books, it doesn't matter. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, okay, good. How many of us know them? Five Ways of Losing Weight, good. But you know what? You know yourself more than anybody else. And if you can come to terms with who you are and understand your weaknesses, correct your weaknesses because we don't know what they are. So when I write five habits of cells, I don't know that your habit actually is the seventh one. So net impact, the path to purpose is self. The path to purpose is passion. The path to purpose is resilience, gumption, understanding that without you, we can't be the humans we ought to be. God bless you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.